Oh, folks, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about this. We are in the continuation of the 11th Doctor and Valerie Lockwood Adventures, starring Jacob Dudman and Sophia Ingar as the 11th Doctor and Valerie. So we've got this incredible range, which is essentially Series 7, Part A, Part 2 where you've got this sort of mid-series series between the events of The Snowmen and The Bells of St. John, where the 11th Doctor is trying to track down Clara and is getting mysterious phone calls on board the TARDIS. And he's got a new companion in tow, half cyborg, half awesome badass from the future Valerie, played by Sophia. And we've got Geronimo, all of time and space, which we've reviewed before. And now we've got not only everywhere and anywhere, but also Broken Hearts, which we're going to talk about first. This is a standalone release and it's essentially the series seven part B part one finale. Now, for those of you who don't know, minor spoilers for the ending of All of Time and Space, but that ends with a story called Curiosity Shop by James Goss. And that is a story which sort of quite literally and metaphorically rips Valerie apart emotionally and physically. And you kind of think, obviously there should be some fallout from that, right? Like emotional fallout. We can't just go onto the next box set and not sort of address that, right? Well, apparently Jacob Dudman felt the same way. So Alfie Shaw, who was essentially the showrunner of this 11th Doctor Chronicles range, for this series at least, decided to do a brand new story that is sandwiched between these two box sets, which essentially deals with the repercussions of Curiosity Shop. It's a skeleton cast, as in it is just Jacob Dudman and Sophia Ingar. It is a two-hander. So the Doctor and Valerie are on the planet Iphthius, where it seems like some massive genocidal event has taken place. There's nobody there, there's no signs of life. However, they are picking up some life signs, some life readings on one of the computers still operating on the planet. It's picking up three life signs. Two of them are the Doctor and Valerie. So they go out searching for the third one whilst dealing with all of the repercussions of the last box set, specifically Curiosity Shop, because Valerie is not feeling very good about being the Doctor's companion right now. However, what's worse is that on the planet it's Iptheus, there is a broadcasting repeating message saying that the Doctor and their companion said that they would help. So they're waiting for the Doctor to come and help along with their companion, giving no name, the Doctor and the companion. So Valerie is feeling a little bit dejected there that they're not named. But also the fact that this genocidal event has happened, but the Doctor is too late to help them. However, he still left a massive impact on the planet, as you can tell from this Ate the Doctor statue on the cover, but let me just play a quick clip from Broken Hearts. What in the name of all... Also complicated. No, Doctor! Come and look at this statue! There's a sentence that never ends well. Tell me it's not an angel. Get away from it! Whatever you do, don't... It's definitely not an angel. Oh. Oh! Erected in eternal appreciation of the Doctor and their companions. It's a whopper! Ha! Oh, nice to know somebody appreciates me. Bit bomb damage, but they missed the old noggin. Together they saved the Vale of Iphthius on two separate occasions. I guess the third time would have been the charm. The Vale of Iphthius. But this statue isn't you. Unless whoever carved it was even worse at crafting than you are. Oh, that face. Yeah, not yours. Right, no. Probably ought to have mentioned this before. You're not the Doctor. Valerie? This statue, is he the Doctor? Well, yes, well, he, he was, but he's sort of gone. Gone to lunch or gone as in dead? Well, the, the latter, I suppose, but... But what? You stole his identity? What about the TARDIS? Did you steal the TARDIS? No! Or, yes, actually, a bit. Well... Completely, but not like you think. Who the hell are you? Really, if you're not the Doctor, then who are you? Exactly. I really don't know you at all, do I? So you've got this really interesting Doctor companion dynamic where you've got the Doctor essentially having to explain his deal to a companion who's particularly not on good terms with him right now after the events of Curiosity Shop. But you've also got this subplot as well. As you can see on the cover here, you've got these two rescue robots who are making their way across this post-apocalyptic wasteland searching for survivors. And over the course of the centuries that they're looking on this planet for, 
They develop personalities. You've got Lionel and Augustus, who are played by Safia and Jacob, respectively. So it is just these two actors playing these four characters. And as Lisa McMullen, the writer of this story, describes it in the making of, it is a cross between Wally -E and The Last of Us. And Broken Hearts is a devastating story. And my only complaint is that it should have been in the box sets proper and not a standalone release that is quite easily missed. I understand that it takes place in its own production block. I understand that it might be a little bit difficult to attach it to the beginning of Everywhere and Anywhere. But honestly, Broken Hearts is so good and is so like key and, and like essential to the 11th Doctor and Valerie's story, at least as far as I'm concerned, that to make it its own standalone release me it kind of undersells how good broken hearts is this is a phenomenal two-hander where you've got the doctor and valerie struggling to compartmentalize their relationship with each other as they try and trek across this desolate wasteland trying to find this sole survivor of this planet but valerie doesn't know if they can trust the doctor anymore and the performances are absolutely superb uh, Jacob and Sophia have got incredible chemistry with each other, but it's like anti-chemistry here because they're, they, you know, Sophia absolutely hates the Doctor right now. At one point, the Doctor says, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm a friend, but I don't know if she's my friend at the moment. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely terrific in terms of just the dynamic there and the way it culminates as well into a really heartfelt and satisfying ending. Broken Hearts is amazing, and I, it's amazing as well how just incredibly well Lisa McMullen has fitted into the 11th Doctor Chronicles range as well. To my knowledge, this is the first time she's ever written a story for the 11th Doctor, at least as far as Big Finish is concerned, at least as far as like a dedicated 11th Doctor story, but she absolutely slots this story in here perfectly. In what is essentially the series, um, the 11th Doctor Chronicles series part one finale, like, I don't know what you'd call because it's already like slotting in between series 7 part 1 and series 7 part 2. So I don't know what you'd call it, but it, whatever it is, it's the part 1 finale where all of the fallout from the last story laid brilliantly down by James Goss is sort of coming home to roost here. And it's very similar to like the Edge of Destruction, where you get the, the tensions and the distrust of the Doctor and the Companion being brought up to the surface so that it can like break apart and then form together and crystallize into something far stronger for the second half of the range. And Broken Hearts does an incredible job at, at, at doing that, whilst also giving us a really satisfying and heartfelt story between the Doctor and Companion and these two Two really adorable rescue robots who I really was rooting for over the course of the story. And also, just to see how the Doctor has to sort of explain things like the Time War and regeneration and that he's, he stole a TARDIS, but not in the way that uh, that Valerie might think. It is honestly tour de force performances from both of them. It genuinely is. And I know that tour de force is a really like wanky way of saying it, but it really is incredible performances here. Over the course of Broken Hearts and Everywhere and Anywhere, obviously... I know that Matt Smith is not doing Big Finish at the moment, but honestly, over the course of these four stories, Spirit of the Seas and All's Fair and Sins of the Flesh for this one as well, over the course of these four stories that I marathoned today, I never thought, oh, this is a Matt Smith impressionist. This is the 11th Doctor. Jacob Dudman embodies this role so fervently, so brilliantly, that over the four hours I was listening to these stories and having my heart broken numerous, numerous times over the course of it, we'll get to this in a moment, I never thought, this isn't Matt Smith, this isn't the 11th Doctor. And the fact that there's such a great companion joining the 11th Doctor here as well makes it all the sweeter. Broken Hearts is essential listening for those who are listening to the 11th Doctor range. Essential listening. If you're dipping in and out, fair enough if you want to, if you want to bypass it. I don't think you should. But if you're dipping in and out, fair enough. But if you are listening to the 11th Doctor's range, do not miss out on Broken Hearts. Now, we've got Volume 5 proper, which is actually Volume 3. The Doctor Chronicles branding is weird because Volumes 1 and Volumes 2 are not the 11th Doctor and Valerie story. They're, a, they're their own standalone thing. It, it starts at Volume 3. That's a branding nightmare. But anyway, Part 3, Everywhere and Anywhere, is a trilogy of hour-long stories. Spirit of the Season by Georgie Cook. All's Fair by Max Tchaikovsky, and Sins of the Flesh by Alfie Shaw. Like I said, Alfie Shaw is the showrunner and script editor of this current run of 11th Doctor and Valerie Adventures. And of course, you can see this is a Cyberman-themed box set, or at least the last story, Sins of the Flesh, is the Cyberman story. 
But it does open with a super festive story, Spirit of the Season by Georgia Cook. Now, Georgia Cook did a really great historical with the 11th Doctor and Valerie a couple of box sets ago. So it's great to see that Georgia is back as well. And it's a Christmas miracle. The Doctor and Valerie have found Clara. Well, not really Clara. They found another Clara, a young girl played by Becky Wright, who you may remember as being Terry from the Doomsday box set a couple of months back. But this Clara has locked up a bunch of people from different time periods and different, uh, different aspects of history and has given them their own personal Christmas hell. Think of the God Complex meets a Christmas Carol with a Doctor Who timey-wimey twist. We've got this young girl called Clara who has taken the Doctor, Valerie, and people from different time periods and put them into this strange hellish maze. Let's play a clip from Spirit of the Season. Well, this is new. It, it can't be. It's a courtyard. Harpreet, how are you feeling? Better. Sorry, I, uh, that was... Where are we? The well. The stone arches. The apple tree by the scriptorium window. It's exactly as I remember it. <laughs> Poor brother Eddie. Aw, don't you like your presents? even invited a special guest. Edmund, careful. There's a little boy out there, down by the well. <laughs> silly Eddie, silly Eddie, so small and weak, frightened by a little snow. <laughs> Harpreet, grab Edmund. I'll get the boy. Got him! Oh no, Valerie. You can't go back and alter the past. Think of the web of time. Hypocrites! Oh, I hate you. Sticks and stones will break your bones. So don't say another rude word to me. Honestly, that voice for Clara, that's the voice and the intonation that I imagine my cat Winnie speaks to me in. <laughs> a very evil, malicious person who is locking all of these people. You heard them in the clip there. You've got Edmund, who seems to be this, like, Victorian-era monk. You've also got Harpreet, played by Natasha Patel, who is this 1990s punk rock but the, the, who's this teenager from the 1990s who's into punk rock and stuff so they're all being put into this this weird like maze where they go into these different doors and it's their own like personal living room it's their own personal kitchen or whatever but it's a Christmassy setting they're going through time they're seeing these aspects of Christmas and of the holiday season that brings them a lot of pain and if you've seen the cast list for this box set as well Minor spoiler, but it's in the cast list as well. We see Patricia Lockwood as well, Mandy Simmons, aka Valerie's late mother, who she never really got to say goodbye to. So, of course, this is her own personal version of Hell, where it's her mother, who she's not able to say goodbye to, and it's the last Christmas they spent with each other. And I think what's really interesting as well about Georgie Cook is that she's really sort of gotten into the really cynical and insidious nature of Christmas specials, where you get all of these wonderful Christmas stories. Christmas Carol, um... I'm trying to think of ones that make me cry every year. It's a Wonderful Life, Arthur Christmas, etc. The list goes on, etc. All of these Christmas specials that are deliberately trying to wring really strong emotions out of you, that are trying to make you cry, that are trying to really heighten your emotion during a pretty emotional time of year, whether it be like, you know, it's it's the first Christmas without a relative, or it's a, you, you no longer get to do a tradition, or it's the first Christmas of, of a new tradition or something, but you're missing the old ones. You know, it's the sort of the weird... Uh, heightened emotionality of the season but turned up to 11 and it's like this really intense psychological thriller drama with Valerie in the center of it it's really fascinating character piece and also like a weird metatextual analysis of how they really really want to make you cry and hurt you at Christmas with the media that you're watching, with the media that is on rotation every year. You know, the Christmas special or something is the one that always tries to make you cry. Why are you trying to make me cry every year in terms of my yearly rotation of things that I watch? You know, stuff like that. I don't know if that was a deliberate thing from Georgie Cook, but that's the sort of reading that I got from Spirit of the Season, where this weird entity, this strange, like, pixie, manic energy with the name of Clara is forcing people into a time of year that they are naturally 
already predisposed to be emotionally heightened at and then make them hate it and draw the hate and the anxiety and the anger out of it. Really interesting premise, really interesting setting. It's like a festive god complex and I really like the god complex. I know my first review of it wasn't super glowing but the more I watch the god complex the more I appreciate it and the more I like it. Spirit of the Season is like a more festive and uh you know, because it doesn't have to have a companion departure at the end of it, because it was also like given an extra 10 or 15 minute runtime, it's able to dive into the themes a lot more effectively. It's also such a really, really strong story for Valerie because she gets to see her mother again and she doesn't quite know what to do with it. If given the opportunity to spend the rest of her life in hell to spend more time with her mother, would she take it? And what would the Doctor do to stop her from doing that? Really great companion dynamic. Why is she called Clara? I, if it was explained in the episode, I can't quite recall. But Clara isn't a super uncommon name. You know, Clara, it's not like she's called Nardol. You know, if you running into multiple Nardols is difficult. Running into multiple Claras across all of time and space, that's a bit easier to do. Surely that would confuse people since she has the same new name as a, as a modern Who companion. Oh, I, the fact that they are looking for Clara, I, I think it's because part of like the mystery and the disorientation in the first act of the story. If it is explained, I can't remember, but for me it's not a detriment to the story. It, it works quite well in the context of Spirit of the Season. It's a really strong opener. I don't know if it's quite as warm and as fuzzy as 24 Days of December, the 8th Doctor festive story that I talked about before, but it's still so good. Bob Six says the dialogue with Valerie and her mother at the end was gold it really was it was really lovely stuff and honestly over the course of this entire box set they put Sophia Inga through the absolute ringer this is like every single box set they absolutely break Valerie down and Sophia's there every step of the way embodying that role they do an outstanding job probably some of the best performances in terms of like big finishes entire year and I do not say that lightly there are like hundreds of cast members over the course of big finish stories this year alone and Sophia Ingar is like right up there as one of the best of them in this box set alone incredible stuff so we do have All's Fair as well by Max Kachevsky which takes place after the Chicago World's Fair in the late 19th century. In the last box set, Valerie met Rowanna, this character in the far future, and they promise to go on a date with each other at some point. She's played by Mia Tomlinson, and they decide, okay, we're finally going to go on that date. We're going to go to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. However, it's the worst first date imaginable, because not only is there some weird, hellish, hulking creature stomping around destroying everything, but also somebody turns up from the future claiming to be Valerie's husband, Hayden Lockwood, played by Christopher Ragland. Let's play a clip from All's Fair. Chicago 1893, opening day of the World's Fair. One great big showing off party for all the world's biggest show offs. Scientists, artists, architects, and you, Mr. Lockwood, what are you doing here? I live here. Always have, always will. Hmm. Hold still. It's gotta be some kind of mind control, right? Or he's not a robot, is he? Or... Oh, none of the above. Just an ordinary human with an ordinary human brain and slightly dodgy human kidneys. You have got transplants in 1893, yes? Uh... Mr. Lockwood. Who came up with that anyway? Was it me? Sounds like me. What's weird about him taking my name? Yeah, my century is remembered for many inventions, but I'm afraid egalitarianism isn't one of them. Oh, can't wait. So what? Someday I wake up and go, all of time and space? Nah, just drop me off somewhere between light bulbs and street cleaning, please. But if he isn't from your future, how did he know where to find you today? That's a point. Top marks. Have you got some sort of Valerie detector, Mr. Lockwood? And if so, could I borrow it? Because that'd really come in handy. <clears throat> Our honeymoon. Niagara Falls. Thunderously cliched, I know, but it was all I could afford at the time. <laughs> That's us. You look... happy. I look... Amazing, actually. Who knew I could pull off bowler hats? <laughs> and uh, on the back. Chicago, 1st of May, 1893. Find me at the fair. Well, that's just cheating. The day I met you, you knew exactly who I was. For you, that day was but one of many. Well, I had all those days still to come. 
I just never considered I might someday look into your eyes and see nothing of the life we've shared together. So, if the previous story, Spirit of the Season, was this 11th Doctor and Valerie season equivalent of the Christmas special, All's Fair is the season premiere, which lays the groundwork for the upcoming episodes leading us to the end game in February with the victory of the Doctor box set. Because All's Fair essentially sets up the new status quo for the 11th Doctor and Valerie. With that in mind, I'm not going to dive too deeply into the actual plot of the story because it involves a lot of Valerie's personal future, what ultimately her fate is going to be and whether or not the Doctor is going to try and prevent that, but also an awful lot of personal stuff happens. I will say, it's, it's, it's a bit unfortunate because I do want to dive properly into this story and I think that Max um, Kachevsky has done an incredible job with the script. Like, honestly, the third act, I was on the brink of tears. Like, throughout, the entire third act, I was holding back tears. Not just a couple of scenes, but an entire act of the story. It was an incredible script, an incredible story with incredible performances and such. And also, shout out as well to Christopher Ragland, who plays Hayden Lockwood, Valerie's future husband. More like Christopher Chadland. I <laughs> got him. But yeah, he does such a great job at embodying this character who has sort of like stumbled into this future with the Doctor and Valerie without knowing it. And the whole timey-wimey collateral damage that can come with being the Doctor's companion. Essentially, Valerie is the Doctor in this scenario. And Hayden is the River Song, where they're sort of predestined to be together because of timey-wimey web of time stuff and the, the, the chronological nature of their relationship needs to be maintained. It's absolutely mad. The way that it's passed out over this hour-long story, also through the lens of this character Rowana, played by Mia Tomlinson, who we, we're rooting for Valerie and Rowana to be together in this story. We're rooting for them because, you know, we met Rowana in the last box set and they've got such great chemistry and she seems like a lovely person, but just to be going on a first date with somebody who you're really into and then their future husband turns up and you know that they're a time traveler. So this is kind of legit. It's such a heartbreaking character arc. I hope we see more of Rowana in the final box set, but even if if we don't, this is still such a wonderful, bittersweet end to the character with a wonderful final scene. Overall, this box set, Everywhere and Anywhere, is super duper gay, and we love it. We've got a non-binary lead actor. We've got like what could potentially be a polyamorous relationship happening with these three. Uh, and also, of course, the subject matter of Sins of the Flesh. It's a very gay box set, and I highly, highly approve. But this is such a strong and assertive starter to what could be the beginning of the end of the 11th Doctor and Valerie. It's, uh, there is a lot of just smashy, smashy, big monster destroying the, the world's fair, but the fact that the emotional undercurrent for it runs so strong, and it's so entrenched in the characters' pre-established relationships and their dynamics, it, it carries it completely. Even if this was, like, your very first exposure to these characters, which it shouldn't be, this is, like, the part two a season premiere you should be well acquainted with these characters by now the fact that it's able to stand on its own feet as just an incredible timey-wimey time traveler's husband type story is absolutely um a sight to behold now I do know that the most talked about story is Sins of the Flesh by Alfie Shaw because it is the one with the most potent allegory it is the one with the Cybermen but for all accounts, I do think All's Fair is the best story of this box set. And these are like back-to-back-to-back bangers. But it's mainly because Spirit of the Season is able to be a standalone, uh, emotionally charged and super powerful Christmas story. This is like, obviously, the pivot on which the Doctor and Valerie relationship is going to like... We're going in a different direction now for the last like six episodes. And I'm all here for it. Count me in. And the fact that the 11th Doctor is now dealing with another character, which predestination could be part of their fate now, after, you know, Clara, Amy and Rory, River Song, it, what, the fact that this is the 11th Doctor now doing all of this works so well. And also the fallout of, the, the more I think about this, the more I love it, the fallout of the time war as well, when the actual villain of the story plays their hand and gives their motive it's like not only do you get it not only do you understand sort of where they're coming from even though it's it's monstrous what they're doing but you kind of get it and the doctor's the reason it's all happening so good so good 
also so good, Sins of the Flesh by Alfie Shaw. Let me just read the uh, the blurb here for you. Is your child exhibiting sinful behavior? Have they set themselves on the road of eternal damnation? Has everything you tried failed? Feel like you're out of options? Don't worry, we can help. Bring them to the Rebirth organization today. Bring them to be converted. So, like I said, we do have a non-binary leading actor here playing a at least pansexual, bisexual character as well. And we're dealing with a story here, bring them to be converted. And Valerie's on the cover here with Cyberman arms. What is going on here? Is this some sort of weird neo-Christianity, like late stage fascism type stuff? Or is this just a weird fun Cyberman story? Let's play a clip from Sins of the Flesh. Okay, gather in a circle, please. How's everyone feeling? Excited? Nervous? Better both? Can I just say how proud I am of all of you? Coming to get help? It takes guts. Round of applause for you all. Now, before we begin, any questions? Hi, sorry, this might sound kind of dumb, but the redemption suits, how does the conversion work? Not dumb at all. I'd have been baffled if no one had asked. You are touched by the divine. Right. And is that a metaphor, or is it... <laughs> oh, no, that's quite literal. And before you ask, it's completely painless. Any more questions? Great. In that case, let's go round the circle and introduce ourselves. I want everyone to say hi back as well. So, you could start us off. Uh, yeah, sure. Hey, I'm Lily. Hi, hi Lily. Lily. Exactly like that. Well done, everyone. And then, once you've introduced yourselves, I want you all to share when you first started having unnatural urges. Way to make the subtext and just make it into the text. I know writers are used subtext and they're all cowards. Yes, Sins of the Flesh is explicitly named in the text itself to be about conversion therapy for LGBTQ plus people. And it handles the subject matter so effectively, so deftly, that I've, I honestly do think that if you are, like, affected by the subject matter, the episode should genuinely come with a trigger warning. It is so um, locked in to the subject matter of the Cybermen as an allegory for conversion therapy. Because, it, you know, they mentioned that, you know, they mentioned the urges in that clip but in the next scene we do have that character lily talking about the first time that they had a crush on their female friend this is definitely about christian conservatism and conversion therapy explicitly in the text itself the doctor and valerie are investigating the rebirth organization and there's the redemption suits which are the cybermen suits of armor which they are brought to the rebirth organization to be touched by the divine they wear the suits for an indeterminate amount of time and then once they're cured in quotes the suit should just drop away and they are now pure and they are now free of sin to combine the cybermen in a conversion therapy allegory might in some cases may seem like square like a, like putting the square peg into the round hole outside of the you know you will be converted you know apart from that phrasing that has been uh, part of the cybermen's like lexicon for the past 60 years you know outside of that you may think it's not the most perfect fit but the way they rationalize it in sins of the flesh is really really effective because they say if the cybermen are invading here they're invading a planet of civilization with weapons and technology and bombs and stuff like that so they may have to be more covert with it so the cybermen could be infiltrating some neoconservative groups and using that as a gateway to get control of the planet when there's enough of them there's enough people being converted where these parents are essentially sending their children into the metaphorical slaughterhouse here to be converted it's really potent really effectively done and of course like i said the metatextual aspect of throwing a non-binary um, a non-binary actor into that as well uh, is really really uh, it's really powerful Sins of the Flesh is kind of meeting the opposing demographic, the opposing viewpoint, where they're at, 
by assuming that they actually care about sin, assuming that they actually care about religion, assuming they are actually devote Christians. Most people, most conservatives I should say, do not give a shit about religion. They just use religion as the pretense to try and grab power and inflict harm upon people. Religion is the pretense, is the veneer of respectability that they do to enact harm on other people. Whereas the text in the sins of the flesh is like, okay, these people of this world are taking their children to the rebirth organization because they actually do believe in the divine. They actually do believe in this afterlife or this spirituality, which is an interesting approach to take for it. I think it's probably the best way to do it without so totally making this like a cartoonishly villainous um, a group of antagonists, although they are definitely villainous and to an extent they are cartoonish. But it's incredibly effective as well in regards to the topicality of it. This story is being broadcast at around the same time that the Brianna Gabe trial is coming to an end, where they, uh, where this teenage trans girl was murdered, stabbed nearly 30 times by two teenagers and they have recently had their murder trial and the two teenagers, the one boy and one girl, uh, they're going to be sentenced in February, but they were found guilty a couple of days ago. And also at the same time that the UK government, the UK Tory government, is trying to essentially do Section 28, the sequel, where they're trying to essentially codify transphobia and anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment into British schools, like actually mandating transphobia and uh, and homophobia and such into British schools. Uh, so the the threats that we're talking about in Sins of the Flesh are they are a metaphor in the actual text of the story, but in the world that the story is being released in, it is very real. It is very potent. It is very evil, and the. It's, it's just a really timely and topical release. Like I said, Sins of the Flesh, if you are somebody who um, is affected by the subject matter, proceed with caution, because it is so effectively handled, not just from the perspective of the subject matter, but also getting into the thought process of the people who are going into the conversion therapy as well, who want to make their families happy, who don't want to be ostracized by their peers, who think that it's for their own good, who are essentially being coerced into... And tortured, Let, let's call it torture, because that is essentially what conversion therapy is. Conversion therapy is the, the respectable veneer of what's being done to predominantly queer youth. Why would somebody who thinks that they come from a loving and caring family put themselves through that? And of course, this is a Cyberman story. Look at the bloody front cover as well. You've got this cover where they've they've recontextualized the time of the Doctor artwork where the 11th Doctor and that story is holding the hand or Cyberman head, but they've done it with the Cybermen one as well. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fun, pulpy sci-fi story, except it's not. It's a super dark metaphor for conversion therapy. But it is also a very human story where the Cybermen are the garnish. They are the backdrop. It is really about valerie navigating the system and also trying to save lily who you heard in that clip played by alexandra Dassar. you've also got mackintosh played by sean Col played by sean connolly who was the creator of the rebirth organization who did this to apparently to save their child carmen played by madison bulliman it's a it's a rough listen in terms of the subject matter in terms of the actual story itself it's a really profound drama. Honestly, I would say this would be a great one for TV, but it is so locked in to the rhetoric, so tuned in to the current political climate, that it might actually be a bit intense for the pre-Watershed family audience that Doctor Who are doing. A lot of Doctor Who's big finish output is, like, obviously it's for an older audience with the disposable income for it these box sets aren't cheap so it is a little bit catered to an older audience but kids could listen to it families could listen to them sins of the flesh is pushing some boundaries in terms of the audience and the the uh, the the prospective audience that being said with that you know slight warning of you know just be braced for your you know just brace yourselves before going into sins of the flesh the 11th Doctor Chronicles Everywhere and Anywhere, like discounting Broken Hearts. This is its own separate release and I will judge it as such. Everywhere and Anywhere has like immediately jumped up to my top three big finish releases 
of 2023. It is, you know, it got in there a few weeks, like a few weeks before the end of the calendar year, but it is one of the best box sets that I've listened to this year, hands down. And the only main competition for it is the River Song Friend of the Family box set, which is amazing, but also the All of Time and Space box set that preceded it back in February. It just kind of shows how amazing and how consistent the output has been for this 11th Doctor and Valerie range. It's going from strength to strength as it goes into its second half, into its ultimate end game here. Because we do have the finale, the Doctor Chronicles Volume 6, Victory of the Doctor, coming out in February, with stories from John Dorney, Felicia Barker, and Alfie Shaw, which features, of course, as you can see here, the Paradigm Daleks, and a story called Victory of the Doctor, with the blurb reading, he told them to run, they should have listened. So this is like one of my most anticipated big finish releases for 2024. And it's only because the 11th Doctor Chronicles range over the past year and a half has been just so, so good. From Geronimo to now, highly recommend it. There are some big finish ranges that I think you can dip in and out of, whatever. This one, I unabashedly recommend all of them all of these ranges so far and i'm praying that this sticks the landing in february i have an incredible amount of faith in this creative team i really really can't wait to see the doctor and valerie take on the daleks in a four-part finale it's gonna be epic i can't wait for it but yeah everywhere and anywhere top tier doctor who some of the best 11th doctor stuff as this companion dynamic goes from strength to, to strength with three 9 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 stories back to back. Incredible stuff. I don't know how they do it.